Hello, my name is Paul Benson. I am a lawyer at the law firm of Michael Best and Friedrich, and I am a member of the Agribusiness Food and Beverage subgroup at Michael Best. Today I'm going to talk to you about five hot topics in the food and beverage safety space. And before doing so, I have to confess, uh, it was very difficult trying to limit this presentation to only five topics because food and beverage issues are at the forefront right now in most of the news and in the type of work that I do, litigation work, uh, food and beverage litigation is at the forefront there as well. But having said that, I only have a certain amount of time, so I am going to limit my remarks to these five hot topics. So here are the five topics that we have chosen. The first relates to the prosecution of company executives for food safety violations. The second relates to the growing public concern over flavorings, colorings, and other artificial ingredients in food and beverages. The third relates to energy drinks, dietary supplements, and the ever-growing caffeinated products industry. The fourth relates to GMOs. GMOs standing for genetically modified organisms or genetically modified food and the natural and organic food movement that relates to the GMO movement. And then last but certainly not least, the fifth hot topic is litigation over deceptive food and beverage labels and advertisements. So starting with topic number one the prosecution of company executives for food safety violations. Any discussion of this topic starts, starts with what we call the Park Doctrine, and that is uh, the Park Doctrine is named after the 1975 United States Supreme Court case, United States versus Park. In the Park case, uh, the Supreme Court established an interesting and, until recently, seldom used doctrine which allows the manager of a corporation, as well as the corporation itself, to be prosecuted under the Federal Food, Drugs, and Cosmetic Act for the introduction of misbranded and adulterated articles into interstate commerce. The Park Doctrine, until fairly recently, was, again, not used very often. But starting in the late 2000s and now carrying into today, the Park Doctrine has been invoked a lot more frequently. And so I want to highlight three cases uh, that have arisen under the Park Doctrine and that relate to the prosecution of company executives for food and safety violations. The first case uh, in involving the Park Doctrine relates to the Jensen brothers. Uh, the, Two brothers, um, Eric and Ryan Jensen, were charged with six federal misdemeanors related to the 2011 listeria outbreak that was blamed on their cantaloupe. Uh, they have, in 2013, uh, entered into a plea agreement. And as a result of that plea agreement, they were sentenced to six months of home detention, five years of probation, and $150,000 in restitution. One of the interesting aspects of this particular prosecution is that, whether it was part of the plea agreement or not, the Jensen brothers actually met with the families of some of the victims at the courthouse. And it is reported that during the course of those conversations and that meeting, the victims' families expressed their um, emotions about the situation and the Jensen brothers, in fact, apologized. Another interesting aspect of the Jensen brothers' prosecution is that um, subsequently, Jensen brothers has sued its auditor, an outfit called Primus Labs, and argued that two weeks before the 2011 outbreak that involved their cantaloupe, Primus Labs had given their facility a clean bill of health. The second 
major prosecution of corporate exec executives relates to Peanut Corporation of America. And the gentleman who is uh, pictured on the lower part of the slide here uh, is Stuart Parnell. And Mr. Parnell has been the focus, uh, along with some other executives, of the PCA prosecution. February 21st of last year, there was a 76 count federal indictment that was filed against four PCA executives. Mr. Parnell in particular has fought this indictment uh, very, very um, strenuously. Multiple motions have been filed in the case. Some of them related to Mr. Parnell's uh, passport rights and whether or not he was a flight risk. Uh, there was an effort to try to uh, obtain uh, Hartford Insurance's investigation tapes and related materials and ultimately that motion was successful so Hartford Insurance had to turn that over. Uh, there was a motion filed by the PCA executives to have separate trials rather than all being tried together. That motion was denied. And perhaps the most interesting uh, motion that was filed was filed by Mr. Parnell who claims that he suffers from attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, his lawyers are alleging, he was not able to um, have the requisite mens rea to uh, perform some of the intentional acts that he is accused of. That uh, defense has been the subject of vigorous motion practice and is in the process of being adjudicated uh, at the time of this taping. Interestingly, the case is scheduled to go to trial later this year and the government has a plea agreement in place with the former operations manager of the PCA plant, a guy by the name of Michael Kilgore. He is expected to be the prosecution's star witness in the case. The last um, prosecution under the Park Doctrine uh, relates to a uh, gentleman who actually lives in Wisconsin but the plant is located in Elmhurst, Illinois. The company is called Queso Cinchillo de Guerrero. Um, in 2007, its Elmhurst, Illinois facility received 110,000 pounds of tainted cheese from a Mexican company that they had been doing business with. Uh, the FDA actually found out about this and placed a hold on the cheese so that it could be inspected. But during the process of pl in between placing the hold and the FDA actually coming out to do the inspection, some of the cheese went missing. It was subsequently determined that employees of the company were told by company executives to wash the cheese and simply ship it out to multiple stores in multiple states. Well, FDA wasn't very happy about that, so there was a prosecution that ensued. And Miguel Leal, the president and owner, uh, was among those charged. In April of 2012, he pled not guilty to any wrongdoing. But just last week, March 18th of 2014, he pled guilty to the introduction of adulterated food into interstate commerce conspiracy, and obstruction of justice. Mr. Leal is currently awaiting sentencing, and it will be interesting to see how his sentencing goes, because in these criminal prosecutions under the Park Doctrine, uh, many feel that the Jensen brothers got off easy, but the Jensen brothers cooperated. Many feel that Mr. Parnell is being treated very harshly, but Mr. Parnell is fighting vigorously. It will be interesting to see in the case of Mr. Leal whether or not he will be treated it will be interesting to see in the case of Mr. Leal how he will be treated given the fact that he ultimately decided to cooperate. The second topic I would like to talk to you about in the food and beverage safety space uh, relates to the growing public concern over flavorings, colorings, and other artificial ingredients in food and beverages. Food flavorings have been in the news and the subject of litigation for at least 10 years. In particular, a chemical called diacetyl 
has been the focus of a great deal of litigation. Diacetyl is the flavoring that occurs actually naturally in a number of products like beer and butter and cheese and wine. It is uh, attributed, uh, its flavor profile I should say, is uh, consistent with that of butter. So many argue that diacetyl is the chemical that makes butter taste like butter. Uh, litigation has been ongoing over that chemical uh, for quite some time and it started in the microwave popcorn space. Uh, companies were making flavorings containing the chemical diacetyl that were sold to microwave popcorn manufacturers and those flavorings were um, uh, the subject of litigation. It started with litigation involving workers at the plants but has now expanded into consumers who are claiming that they are suffering from respiratory problems due to their exposure to diacetyl based on their consumption of microwave popcorn. In addition to microwave popcorn, the litigation has grown now to include not only diacetyl, but diacetyl substitutes and other chemicals that fall into the same chemical family as diacetyl, a chemical family called diketones. And the products have changed as well. It's no longer just microwave popcorn. It now includes bakery products, chocolate, and even coffee. Food colorings have been the topic of a great deal of ten attention recently. In January of this year, the Caramel Coloring 4 MEI was put under FDA re-examination. The chemical had been looked at by FDA previously, and the FDA said that the levels that consumers were exposed to of the chemical were not a problem but a uh, uh, article appeared in the magazine Consumer Reports that suggested that at least in some sodas uh, the level of 4-MEI might be excessive. So FDA is going to relook or re-examine that issue. In February of this year Pepsi and Goya were sued over the 4-MEI levels in some of their soda products. The group Center for Science in the Public Interest, or CSPI, has uh, been circulating petitions related to uh, the use of what they call neurotoxic chemicals in artificial colors. And those chemicals uh, and the petitions were focused in particular on Kraft Mac and Cheese and M&Ms. The petitions were successful in getting over 348,000 signatures. Kraft ultimately uh, decided that it would phase out some of these artificial colors from uh, its uh, SpongeBob SquarePants Kraft macaroni and cheese. M&M's, on the other hand, has taken a more vigorous uh, position and has indicated that the artificial colors and artificial flavorings in M&M's are safe. Do you know who that is? If you don't, you should. Um, that is the food babe. Her real name is Vani Hari. Uh, she um, uh, is a uh, food safety activist. She has a blog. She has a website. And she has been in the news recently because of her very public campaign to have Subway remove bread dough strengtheners and a flour bleaching agent from the bread products used in its subs. Um, this particular product, uh, which has a chemical name that is uh, very difficult to pronounce, so I'm not even going to give it a shot, uh, is not only used in Subway bread, but it's also used in yoga mats and uh, shoe rubber. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, she was successful, along with others, in convincing Subway to remove that chemical and use a natural chemical in its place. Kraft uh, is in the process of removing certain artificial preservatives from its cheese slices in response to concerns about the safety of those uh, particular artificial preservatives. And then um, all of this uh, focus on these artificial flavorings could result in a major overhaul 
of the generally recognized as safe or grass standards. In fact, last month, uh, a lawsuit was filed by the Center for Food Safety over a number of the additives that are currently considered grass or generally recognized as safe, suggesting that, uh, in fact, they are not and need to be re-examined. Topic number three relates to energy drinks, dietary supplements, and other caffeinated products. Uh, let's start with energy drinks. Energy drinks are extremely popular. They are predicted to be a $21.5 billion industry by 2017. And while many of us may think that these uh, particular um, drinks are consumed almost exclusively by teenagers and young adults, uh, the reality is, is that busy young moms are among the biggest users of these uh, particular products, suggesting that their appeal is quite widespread. When talking about these types of products, there are at least three issues to consider. Their health and safety, the rules that apply to them, and how they are marketed, particularly to youth. Let's start with health and safety. Last year, at about this time, uh, Trial Magazine ran an article and uh, for those of you that are familiar with Trial Magazine, it's considered the magazine of the plaintiff's bar. And one of the taglines in the um, article was, energy drinks are injuring and killing teenagers and young adults, leading to lawsuits against products manufacturers. Um, whether you agree with that or think that that's an accurate statement is irrelevant. The fact of the matter is, is that the plaintiff's bar is very interested in these energy drinks and uh, is, has, have been for some time launching a number of lawsuits over them. But in addition to the plaintiff's bar, the cities of Chicago, New York, and San Francisco undertook efforts to, in some instances, ban, in other instances, limit the content of these drinks, in particular the caffeine content in these drinks. The very popular monster drinks, Five Hour Energy, and another drink called Redline, which is primarily uh, marketed to uh, people in the health and fitness industry, uh, have all been sued over the past 12 months for allegedly causing injuries and deaths due to the consumption of these products. And then in February of this year, a study came out that ostensibly links teen energy drink intake and consumption to illegal drug use. Again, it's a link, not a causal connection, but needless to say, it is an interesting thing that is going to be looked at over the course of time. What rules apply to these types of products? Do you know who that is? That gentleman is Daniel Fabricant. Mr. Fabricant is the director of the FDA's Dietary Supplement Division. And in March of last year, he stated, we don't have energy drinks defined by any regulation. So when you ask the question, what rules apply? The answer is, we really aren't sure. In March of last year, Monster started selling itself as a beverage rather than a dietary supplement. Why? Well, among other things, by marketing itself as a beverage, it was no longer required to report deaths and injuries related to the product or allegedly related to the product to the federal regulators, whereas as a dietary supplement, it had to do that. Uh, the FDA is trying to respond to this. In January of this year, the FDA issued guidances to help clarify what rules should apply to these energy drinks and these dietary supplements but those guidances are just that. They are guidances and they are not har any hard and fast rules. So this area is developing. The final issue I'd like to address in this space relates to uh, how these products, dietary supplements, energy drinks, caffeinated products are marketed, particularly to children. Last year, the city of San Francisco sent a letter to Monster um, and it was concerned about its marketing practices. 
and after outlining those concerns, it threatened legal action. Well, Monster decided to sue preemptively uh, and brought a, a lawsuit against the city of San Francisco seeking an injunction preventing uh, the city from, uh, among other things, suing them over these issues. And uh, as you might expect, the city of R San Francisco returned the favor and sued Monster. Uh, in December of last year, Monster's case was dismissed, but the city of San Francisco's case continues. Um, the AMA in June of last year proposed a possible ban on these energy drinks, in particular energy drinks being sold to, um, uh, to our youth. July of last year, company executives were called to Capitol Hill to testify at a U.S. Senate committee hearing on this issue. And multi-district litigation continues to go on in the false advertising area, claiming that things like five-hour energy um, are making false claims about increased alertness and physical performance that at the end of the day, they really don't do what they claim to do. So, for those of us that litigate in this area, we see the energy drink and supplement makers uh, advancing a fairly simple common sense defense. They say, look, these products aren't all that different than drinking X number of cups of coffee. That, of course, raises the entire question of how much caffeine is too much. Uh, and it's a huge issue right now because in addition to energy drinks and dietary supplements, there are a whole slew of new caffeinated products. Uh, waffles, syrup, Cracker Jack have all uh, some, have been marketed in some instances with uh, caffeine added to them to increase their kick. Last year, gum actually got the most attention. Uh, Wrigley's was in the process of coming out with a gum called Alert Energy Gum that had uh, increased caffeine content in it. The FDA and others, however, expressed concerns about that, and Wrigley's ultimately decided to halt production. At the time of this taping, the FDA is considering some regulations related to uh, these particular types of products and the amount of caffeine that they contain. So during 2014, I expect to hear something from the FDA on that, on that subject. Topic number four relates to genetically modified organisms or GMOs and the natural and organic food movement. Uh, if you have been reading anything in the food and beverage space, You've been hearing a lot about GMOs and whether or not GMOs are safe. The reality is this. Nearly all of the scientific evidence that currently exists indicates that food with GMOs is safe. In fact, uh, last year the Journal of Food and Chemical Toxicology actually had to retract an article that suggested GMOs were linked to cancer. Uh, a controversial report, however, has come out this year that suggests a possible, uh, that GMOs are a possible trigger for gluten sensitivity and celiac disease. It will be interesting to see as that particular article is examined closer whether it will be retracted or remain in the scientific literature. Genetically modified foods continue to receive approval despite these objections. And just in the last year, genetically modified salmon, corn, and other products were approved in the Euro for uh, consumption in the European Union and in the United States. 2013 and 14 was uh, very significant as it related to the legislative initiatives concerning GMOs. Connecticut and Maine actually passed labeling requirements so that if a particular food product has GMOs in them, it has to disclose that. New Hampshire and Washington had their similar GMO initiatives defeated. Just this past year, California has introduced a, a Senate bill to require labeling of GMOs. 
And Colorado, again this year, has started circulating a ballot initiative that would also um, require the labeling of GMO food products. With regard to GMOs, uh, those opposed to GMOs argue that you have an absolute right to know exactly what it is that you're eating and what you're putting in your body. So as a consequence, they say, you need to have labels on food products that contain GMOs so that people can make informed decisions. The response to that position, and that response primarily comes from industry, is feasibility, both from a pragmatic standpoint and from a cost perspective, that requiring this type of labeling is pragmatically very difficult and will be extremely expensive. And the reality is that at least as it relates to uh, certain uh, countries uh, that are underdeveloped or in the third world, uh, without things like GMO wheat, it's very possible that there isn't an adequate food supply to feed the rest of the world. The Grocery Manufacturers Association has taken the lead here and uh, has actually formulated an unprecedented alliance of food and beverage and agricultural value chain partners in an effort to seek federal legislation to address the safety and labeling of GMOs. One company is actually out in front on this, and that's General Mills. General Mills came out very recently with non-GMO Cheerios. It will be interesting to see if uh, that disclosure uh, on the package labeling has any impact on sales of the product. The market for organic food and beverages is huge. It's predicted to grow 14 percent through 2018 and that's significant when you consider that the sales in 2012 were 81.3 billion. While many people think of the organic industry as being local and small, the reality is, is that most of the organic food uh, is made by some of the biggest companies in the world. Health issues related to organic food and beverages is always at the forefront, but the reality is, is there is little to no evidence that suggests organic food is any safer than non-organic food. There's little to no evidence that suggests that organic food is more nutritious. Uh, you'll see on the slide I, I've indicated except in fruit flies. There actually is a study that seems to suggest that um, exposure to organic versus non-organic foods uh, is actually of health benefit to fruit, fruit flies. Um, that's about all. I, I don't know what else to say about that. But the reality is uh, that organic products are perceived to be tastier and more nutritious and generally, therefore, are more expensive. When we consider the appeal of organic food and beverages, uh, one of the logical connections that you make uh, is to the fact that those products are marketed as being natural. Uh, and there is a huge debate about what natural actually means. That debate has gone all the way up to the courts. And last year, three federal judges, two in California and one in New Jersey, stayed or suspended pending consumer class actions over foods that were labeled natural. Uh, the plaintiffs in those cases were alleging that that natural label was inappropriate because the food products contained genetically modified organisms. Um, the courts, in the process of deciding those cases, put them on hold and actually asked the FDA to provide input in answering the question. On January 6th of this year, the FDA responded to the judge's request and basically told the judges, we're not going to answer the question. We respectfully decline to make a determination at this time regarding whether and under what circumstances food products containing ingredients produced using genetically engineered ingredients may or may not be labeled natural. About a year ago, I attended a conference 
uh, where among the people on the speakers list was a, a, a woman from the FDA. Uh, she was extremely engaging, uh, very outgoing, um, and, and, ex and very, very charming. Um, there were questions and answers at the end, and um, she took a question from the audience where, one, where the audience member flat out asked her, will the FDA decide at some point in the future uh, what it means for a food product or a beverage product to be considered natural? And her demeanor changed entirely, and she leaned over and said very matter-of-factly, no. So uh, this debate about GMOs, organic food, and natural food, I expect will continue throughout 2014 and well beyond. Take a look at these labels then. You may never see them again. In fact, uh, there are some companies that have decided to use substitute language. Uh, this particular product, Quaker Natural Granola, my understanding is is that the natural is going to be removed and instead it will be marketed as Quaker Simply Granola. The last topic that I want to discuss with you uh, relates to litigation over deceptive food and beverage labels and advertisements. Um, this has gotten a ton of attention, both legislatively and legally, which is interesting when you consider that an alarming number of people don't do what these women are doing, meaning read their labels. And when they do read the labels, many people are claiming that they don't understand exactly what it is that they're reading. So, this fact notwithstanding, just the last few months demonstrate how hot this particular area of litigation is. January 15th of this year, an organic food maker uh, was sued in a nationwide class action for concealing, allegedly, the sugar content and overstating the health benefits of its Yerba Mate tea products. The allegation here was that instead of disclosing the fact that the product contained sugar, it instead used the word evaporated cane juice. Uh, and by using that word, or that phrase I should say, the plaintiffs were alleging that that was deceptive and misleading and as a consequence uh, the uh, label was inaccurate. On March 17th of this year, Heinz was sued in a California consumer class action for allegedly falsely advertising its white vinegar as an all-natural product when, at least according to the complaint, it was supposedly derived from genetically modified corn. And then a day later, Coca-Cola was sued in an Illinois consumer class action for allegedly falsely advertising its original formula product in a number of different ways, including making claims that that product has no artificial flavors, no preservatives added, and that it's been that way since 1886. According to the complaint, all of those statements are false, and most interestingly, uh, the complaint alleges that Coke has been reformulated a number of times since 1886. Whether any of that proves to be true, remains to be seen. So the new litigation reality in the food and beverage space is pretty simple, at least as far as I'm concerned, when we are talking about uh, labeling. If your labeling or your advertising makes a health claim or purports to be a natural product or an organic product, there is a very, very good chance you will be sued. So those are the five hot topics. As I said at the beginning of my remarks, there are lots more to cover, but hopefully uh, I've at least touched on some of those that will be of interest to you. Should you have any questions about anything that I've said during the course of this presentation, please feel free to contact me at the telephone number or at the email address listed on the final slide. Thank you.